so let's start. <clears throat> um, it is a true honor to welcome Pashtana Durrani to our next session. Pashtana is the founder of Learn Afghanistan, a grassroots organization established to safely and securely provide education to girls through a distributed network of tablet computers using an offline platform. Through Learn, um, Pashtana has educated 7,000 girls and boys in Kandahar, Afghanistan, and trained more than 80 teachers in digital literacy. Pashtana was named an education champion by the Malala Fund for her outstanding work to advance Afghan girls' education. She was a global youth representative for Amnesty International, is also a winner for the 2021 Talberg SNF Elias and Emerging Leader Prize, which recognizes leaders who've addressed complex global challenges in innovative ways. Pashtana Durrani was also made BBC 100 influential, uh, a member of the BBC 100 influential women list for 2021. And again, I'm very proud to welcome you, Pashtana. I hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, sometimes I feel so much flattered. I'm like, uh, it feels like as if some, <laughs> you are talking about someone else when you guys are talking, introducing me. Um, but thank you so much for this honor for inviting me to talk to all the amazing people who are attending this conference. Now, before we start, I recently had a surgery, so I'm going to make it very short and sweet because I'm not allowed to talk so much. But um, I think I really want to dedicate this specific time to one thing. And that's, I know I come from a background of Afghanistan, so all people think is war. But I also think that there's a warrior inside us and that warrior for me is the educator in me. I'm normally not good in giving keynote speeches or like, you know, something where I have to start and talk um, because I'm always like, you know, more of a back and forth person when people ask me questions and I answer them. That's how I always been. The reason is when I was very young, um, I have a huge family and my family is like 70 male members and every one of them eats first. And I remember my father telling me, he's like, you know what, you're going to eat with us from now on. And I used to sit up at that table and eat with my cousins and my family members who were all male and I was the only female. And I remember being the one who's always silent. My cousins used to over talk and like, you know, every time I used to raise my voice, he used to over talk me. And then I remember one day my father told me, he's like, I gave you the seat on this table, but it's up to you to make your point. Every time someone talks, pass, passes a comment on you, it's very important that you respond back. And I think that's the reason even to this date, I'm very good at interviews because I, I still have that um, loud voice. And since then I have made all my 70 cousins suffer in silence at every meal that we have had together. I think, for women back home from where I come, it's a privilege to have a father like mine or to be able to eat at the same table like uh, the other men do. It's always seen as a privilege. Um, for me, it's very important to realize and make an important point of the fact that it's not a privilege. It's actually an, a right for women to be able to eat at the same table to be able to compete and talk in the same manner as a man of the same family would be expected to do. Today, as I sit um, and talk about all the privileges or rights that's shared with you, uh, with that I'm sharing a part of my life with you guys, I can't help but think that it's been more than 300 years, uh, 300 days, excuse me, more than 300 days that the Taliban have banned girls' education from grade 7 up until grade 12 in Afghanistan, and more than 1 million girls are out of school today who would be actually becoming doctors, um, midwives, teachers, engineers, scientists, and anything and everything that Afghanistan would need in the next five years. In the next two years, we will need more midwives than we have today but right now we don't have any school graduates who would be enrolling in a midwifery school to meet that demand the same goes for doctors the same goes for nurses the same goes for everything else that's happening in afghanistan right now including the 30 percent of workforce which is women and we are not allowed to work legally in our own country 
I can't help but think that even though wars are never started by women, we're always the first people to be actually targeted in the same wars. Um, as an educator, the only way I thought to myself when Afghanistan fell apart on August 15 was that only way I can fight back is by making sure that I don't do what they did for the past 20 years, which was violence, leaning towards violence, making people lose their families, burning schools down to make a point. Our war went cold and we started with our secret schools. On August 15, Afghanistan fell, and on September 30th, we started our first ever school in Afghanistan, which was all digital. Today, as I speak to you guys, I have more than four schools, and all four of those schools have 400 girls who study in secret from grade 7 up until grade 12. Now, for you guys, it might be exceptional given that Taliban have actually banned it, and any teacher who comes and teaches them from grade 7 to grade 12 is actually either imprisoned or hanged. For me, I would say I'm just making the best of what I have and what I do. One thing I would like to point at and one thing I would like to maybe as an educator uh, would want any educator who's listening right now think about is the fact that um, the 16 year old uh, girl in me was very daring than the person I am today. But I still have one thing that I still hold on to and I would want any educator to hold on to, especially those who educate young girls, that we have to dare to dream, dare to educate, dare to question everything, dare to question the brave, dare to be the brave one, and dare to question the patriarchy. I know a lot of men are on this panel and everyone is going to be like, pretty much against men. No, not really. It's just my country has been robbed from its future by men, so I always go there. When I was young, I always thought that I could make the world a better place. The more and more I grow, the more and more I feel like I can actually make the world a better place by educating the future. And I strongly believe that not only Afghanistan, but the whole world will actually be a better place if we ensure that all those 1 million girls from Afghanistan up until any place in the world who cannot access learning can actually access any sort of learning in any medium possible. If it's not a structured learning, a structured school, it can be something which is informal, but it has access to learning. And in the end, all that matters is learning, especially for those who are the future of the world. I would like to stop here because that's how much my quota is right now. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Pashtana, and thank you for speaking to us after the surgery that you had. Um, I think what I'll do is, uh, of course, the uh, uh, if anyone that's listening has a question, please post yeah. it. Um, yeah. I just wanted to say I'm the father, very fortunate husband uh, to a wife and father to three daughters, and it's always my privilege to be at the dinner table with them. And in fact, it's my struggle to try and have my voice heard at that dinner table. So, uh, you know, it's something that you and I can relate to. Um, my first question to you is this, how, you know, we've seen the Taliban in power before, they left, their yeah. back. What's the end game? I mean, is this, is for you going through this exercise, is it about waiting them out? Is it about them changing the perspective? Will they change perspective? Like, what's the end game? I think for me, it's the future that uh, is more important. In the 90s, they came in, they were the worst of our nation, and they had to leave one way or the other because they, they didn't resemble or were part of the nation that is there in place, and the 50% of women who were robbed of their futures. I know today might be the West won't uh, invade the Afghanistan and they shouldn't in the first place, they shouldn't have. But at the same time, at the end of the day, I don't think that they will last in power when they continue to alienate 50% of the country. We are not Gulf countries. We don't have that sort of oil and money. We have to have women in workforce. We have to have women as scientists, as midwives, as doctors. We can't hire people from other countries. We are a poor nation and for us to sustain ourselves, 
we have to accept our women as part of the nation. So the end game is probably accepting Afghan women or Afghan women will just start their own country. I mean, like I'm up for it right now. Thank you for that. And we have a question from Samantha. First of all, she says, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story. And her question is, what's the most important tip you have for teachers wanting to inspire learning their students? I think one thing I, so this is something very personal. So when we were very young, we used to go to a private school and I have a younger sister. She was not so good in school. I remember going to the, uh, her like meetings and everything and her teachers used to tell me like, she's not good. Why do you guys waste so much money on her putting her in a private school? And now that I think to myself, I keep on thinking, I'm like, why, why did those teachers think that just because the kid is not good in learning or doesn't have that the same level of learning method that other kids do in the same class, why do they lose the right to be in the same class, according to the teacher? I think for me as an educator, I come with this one mentality or viewpoint every time I enter a class. Every student is different. Their learning methods are different. It's very important that we understand that it's a right and we have to deliver as an educator, even if the child struggles with what we call the normal learning methods. We need to expand, we need to be innovative, and we need to be able to reach out as a teacher to inspire them. I think that's the most important thing and I still hold it dear to myself. Do you think that the um that the that foreign governments have a role to play in forcing the issue with the Taliban and and, and can they be effective at at changing the Taliban's perspective on the issue of education with girls? I think uh, I like to see it out straight. Um it's less about philosophy when it comes to Taliban. It's less about religion. We all know it. There are other Muslim countries who have women in the workforce, who have women working and studying. Iran and Pakistan are big examples of like extreme religious uh, uh, Muslim countries, but at the same time, they have more women in the STEM uh, and workforce. So for me, I think the Western countries have one thing that they could do. If the women who cannot actually travel from their home to the workplace or girls cannot travel from their house to their school because they're banned, the Taliban shouldn't be able to travel either from their uh, country, from Afghanistan to any other country for any sort of thing. The China and Pakistan shouldn't be giving them free funding for whatever they want. I think that's the most important thing. And I think the West holds the power over those two things. And they can ban them from traveling. They can ban them from having luxurious life in Qatar. And just like their daughters can access education, every daughter of uh, Afghanistan should be able to access education. So for me, it's very political and people don't like to talk about it but it's in reality the west has all the power to force the taliban to open the schools so you know i like to think that i'm fairly up on on international issues but i'm curious about this you describe you know iran and pakistan as both muslim countries that embrace women in the, in schools so what is the philosophy of the taliban that that uh, restricts women from access to education what what is that i think Let's let's look at it this way. Suhail Shaheen, the spokesman of the Taliban right now for the foreign ministry, his two daughters are in school in Qatar and they actually play in a uh, basketball or fo football team, actually. So this shows clearly that they, he, him being on that level, his girls still go to school. So he's not against education. Abbas Tanikzai, his girls go to school in Pakistan. Other, all the major leaders, all their girls go to school. So it openly shows that they're not against education. Majority of their daughters are actually doctors who work in these different countries. The problem is right now they want to use this situation or this topic as a sensitive bargaining chip for their political legitimacy, for more aid, for more funding. So for me, we have to call a spade a spade. We tend to forget when it comes to Afghanistan, people are like, oh no, it's a philosophical religious issue. It's not, if it was, why would they send their own daughters to school? Why would they do something which they wouldn't want for like, you know, their own daughters? So, yeah. Hmm. I, unfortunately, I have to leave you. I could talk to you for a lot longer. I apologize. I'm gonna to have to jump over to the next session, but thank okay. you so much for your time. And please, anyone who's listening, I encourage you to, to pose your uh, question in chat. Thank, thank you. you. Donna, and Thank best of luck to you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much, Pashana. That was a really, really great talk, and it's such a pleasure to have you join us today.
Um, so as Robert said, we'll open up the floor to some questions as per usual. And so, Pishana, maybe if you don't mind sticking around for a couple minutes, uh, sure. just see if any questions come in. Uh, I'll also keep an eye out as well. And then, yeah, we can take it from there. So I'll also be attaching the link here, guys, for the next session, which is going to be coming up at 1245 with Fred Dixon. Uh, so there's a link there as well. And so the floor is open to any cues. Thank you everyone for listening in. I see a lot of thank you, so I'm like, thank you.